reports for the first landing site in Peru, suggesting that SAR has off-road intelligence. More like who's an expensive place to grease up journalists, you dummy. Whenever a species thrives, Enduro Dominance record sales in 2016. We expect them to hunt new terrain, but not like this. KTM just fired a missile at the BMW R1200GS. Collateral damage, significant. Notably the Ducati Multistrada Enduro. The sticker on here says 1290 Super Adventure R. It seems to power itself with the mythical LC8 V-Twin. Now some people say this engine won the car in 2002 and also cut its teeth inside the RC8 Supersport race bike. Well, sort of, anyway. I mean, KTM constantly evolves the LC8, so every encounter is going to be different. Now, this time, like the Super Duke, we see its bore and stroke hollowed out to 1,301 cc's. It also makes 103 foot-pounds of torque and 160 horsepower. This is now the most powerful thing on Earth with a 21-inch front wheel. Sweet mother of Hercules! It's savage! Oh, the humanity! If this is carving out new terrain for KTM, then it's also eating it! Make it stop, please! 160 horsepower does not move dirt. It moves the earth. Let's take a step back and figure out what in the hell we've discovered here. The first glance tells me that the frame and engine are descended from the old 1290, now relabeled the Super Adventure Touring, but the tank and wheel sizes are from the 1190R, which was pure adventure. The headlight is totally alien. It's an LED so powerful that it has its own radiator, a heatsink slashed down the center in order to cool the bulbs. The wheels are spoked and tubeless alloys, made stronger because the old 1190 front used to taco at the first sight of a rut. I can already see the 1190 guys buying these and retrofitting. Most obvious new feature is the giant smartphone on the dashboard. It's six and a half inches of gorilla glass. That means it won't scratch even when the 1290 gets a few crumbs of earth on its mouth. Now, despite what the puff piece journalists say, this does reflect a very normal amount of glare. Also, I could feasibly put a rock right through the 1290's shiny new iPad if I were to drop the bike at just the right angle. Hmm. Is it just me or is this bike alive? It sees when the key is within five feet, making itself ready to race or ready for a pint. It keeps an eye on its own tire pressures. It holds its own cruising speed. The 1290 can even hold itself up on a hill, but only if I buy it a present first. And if I do purchase the Travel Electronics Pack for 600 bucks, I also get smartphone pairing, which is- Hello, Ryan. Your human species is weak. We'll start on pavement so you can stop screaming like a child. The 1290's power curve is extremely linear. It pulls hard, pops the front predictably at 5,000 RPM, and then keeps pulling till you hit peak power just shy of 9,000. Then there's a lull before the limiter at 10,000 RPM, so you wouldn't find the glass ceiling unless you went looking for it. Only problem is the plank seat. I mean, it's great for shifting my weight back and forth on the dirt, but with 160 horses in sport mode, I feel like I'm gonna slide right off the thing. There's a quick shifter included with the electronics upgrade, so I can bang up shifts with no regard for the clutch. And good thing it works both ways, because slamming down shifts is much more enjoyable than grabbing the Brembo brakes. But why? Because the initial bite is pretty weak, and also the feedback is not exactly encyclopedic. The handling is insanely sharp though. I've never felt pavement performance this good on a 21 inch front wheel. Stiffer fork springs result in less nosedive than the 1190, and Bosch cornering ABS lets me yank the lever mid-turn without tucking the front or standing the bike up and running wide. Personally, I'm afraid I'll lose my braking skill, both in lever pressure and in manually balancing the front with rear input. But your human species is weak and- Yeah, yeah. Just like school buses and tanks, the KTM 1290 is narrower than the R1200 GS. All my logic tells me the BMW is still nimbler in the twisties, and I think it is. But from where I'm sitting, the Super Adventure feels sportier due to its smaller size. Not as snappy as the old 1190 though. Honestly, this engine is a little bit too linear on pavement. And there's heaps of power, but it's all potatoes and no hot sauce. Well, I think- Uh, shut up. You know it's true.
Hey, I mean, cheer up though, sport. Your smooth power delivery uh, does make you a great tourer. And remember the 12 volt outlet and the waterproof phone charging compartment. Those are huge touring benefits. And look at your spacious ergonomics. I mean, a 35 inch seat is gonna do that for you. The aluminum handlebars, the foot pegs, the shift lever, the dash, and the windscreen are all adjustable too. Although the ladder moves in emasculating two inches. Allegedly, this prevents my helmet from hitting the windscreen, which literally never happens, but I keep it low anyway because it buffets less like this and it flows more air. The bodywork too also funnels more wind past my torso than the old 1290. Plus KTM put heat guards under the seat, so the header pipe only cooks my ass medium rare rather than the medium well that the 1290 preferred. And despite containing pure hellfire, the engine somehow keeps its heat to itself. Long story short, this 1290 is objectively cooler than previous versions, at least on a summer's day. Other luxuries include cornering LEDs, which light around the bend when the bike feels itself leaning. They're not as punctual as you might expect. Initiate a turn and you'll notice the beam catching up a second later. But hey, I mean the things are brighter than the sun. Only touring letdown is the throttle by wire return spring. It's too stiff and so it makes my wrist tired after a while. That and the 23 liter tank, which wouldn't be big enough for a bike half this powerful. I've been getting an annoyingly short 250 kilometers before I hit the 3.5 liter reserve. Ah, oh, enough petty criticisms. Transformers, roll out. You look exactly the same. Ah, right. This is a different machine. Limited to 100 horsepower, it is worlds more manageable. Off-road mode also numbs the throttle response, so I no longer carve the Grand Canyon with each twitch of the wrist. Artificial intelligence runs traction control. It gives me the full cocky roost when upright, but it wants to digitally govern the power in a turn. I'm supposed to just slam the throttle and let the bike steer with the engine, and that feels very wrong to a practiced wrist. But don't try to outsmart the machine, because if you modulate the throttle yourself, the traction control just gets pissed and understeers into a ditch. Off-road ABS is brilliant though. It unlinks the front and rear actuators, keeping a tight leash on the former while letting me lock up the latter. The electronic slipper clutch is also very robotic. It measures rear wheel speed to detect chatter and open the throttle accordingly, and it is creepily effective. I can bomb a downshift on the slipperiest surfaces and get nothing, which is both amazing and a little bit unnerving when you're counting on backing the rear. Riding the 1290 fast off-road isn't about trusting my skill. It's about trusting the computer's skill in transforming this bike for the dirt. That's a weird way to ride a motorcycle. To be honest, the 1290 feels exactly like what it is. A big luxury motorcycle that's been whipped and tortured into good dirt behavior. It's unnatural and a little bit sad, like a caged lion. You know what? Screw that. And the SAR can turn everything off on the fly. Give me 160 horsepower, no rider aids, off-road. I'll try unleashing you one more time. With a bit of practice, I can now see that the chassis is brilliant. And it's so balanced and slim between the legs that I'm actually doing this. I can actually ride 160 horsepower off-road. And hell, it is intense. Now the bike gets it up like it runs on Viagra. And by the time the front wheel comes back down, I'm doing 100 in places I really shouldn't be. Don't screw up now. 529 pounds is only a problem if I screw up. I can pick the wrong line, pick the sticky mud. Heaven forbid I have to pick it up. 529 pounds is only a problem when you need to move it. But the bike feels light when it moves itself. Heavier fork springs have it riding high in the suspension stroke, like a dirt bike. And then the 8.7 inch rear shock is a progressive duo piston, offering stiffer compression near the end of travel, so I never bottom out. Don't watch the rocks now. Trust your 9.8 inches of ground clearance and try to forget that KTM skipped the skid plate. Just feather that clutch. It's a piece of straw an extremely light pull to break the camel's back. Slippery stuff at the end here. No clutch needed. 
KTM added weight to the crankshaft so the bike will carry itself near idle. Just chug along at 1500 RPM, no drama, no breaking traction, and I'm out. The 1290 is mechanically one of the top three motorcycles in the world. And its electronic intelligence is only surpassed by its brother, the S version, which touched down in Europe with semi-active suspension. My frustration is entirely my own. I'm good enough to find the digital aids overbearing, but not good enough to master the enormous mechanical potential without them. Your human species is weak, but I call for backup. A small ward, $4,000 cheaper, 35 horsepower smaller, and with less computer control. The enemy of the African twin is being deployed. Now. <laughs>